Hey there everyone. Today I'm going to tackle a real estate private equity modeling test. Now this is the type of test you might see in a technical interview or in a graduate level real estate financial modeling class. And so I thought it might be helpful for you to watch me as, as I model this thing out. Now the genesis of this is I was lurking in on Wall Street Oasis on the real estate forum, came across the thread from someone earlier in 2017 who I was just asking for advice around how to prepare for a technical interview. And while I blogged on this subject, I haven't recorded a thorough video on just how to go through one of these. And so I thought this would be, this would be a worthwhile time. And it so happens in the thread, uh, there was a poster, Yakahito, who uh, I guess had uh, recently or at some point in the past uh, had a, a real estate private equity interview had been given this exercise, uh, a blank Excel workbook, and a couple hours to get it done. And I thought, hey, I'll grab these assumptions, open up my own workbook, and then I'll record it, and, and you guys can watch me as I do it. So let's get started. Let me set up my desktop here. I'm going to drop or uh, put the assumptions along here to the left-hand side. Now, I have a workbook a book up. Uh, I actually already modeled this out. And you can download the workbook. You can find my completed version. I also have a tab here that's called blank. And I left all the cell formatting in where you can come and if you want to just build it alongside me as I do it, uh, that might be a helpful way to learn. Either way, in the upper left-hand corner of uh, this particular tab, there's a link to the thread where you'll find the assumptions used in this video. So let's get started. Now, how I think about this, this is a pretty simple model. And so I'm going to keep it all to one worksheet, one tab. Uh, my thinking is I'm just going to go conceptually top to bottom. I'll start with my development uh, cash flows. Those will flow into my operation cash flows, which will flow into my residual cash flows. I'll layer dead in as I go. And then I'll finish off with uh, property level, uh, unlevered and levered cash flows, followed by my partnership level cash flows through the waterfall uh, to LP and GP returns. I'm going to use these leftmost columns for my assumptions. And then here starting, I don't know, column G off to the right, out to the end of the analysis period is where I'll, I'll put my periodic cash flows and they'll be on a monthly basis. So first things first, I'm just going to build out a date header here and then just drop in uh, some titles over here. So, And from time to time, I'll pause the video so you'll see uh, items just randomly appear. That's because I paused the video, such as right now. So as I begin to build out my date header, I'm going to start with month. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my, my cell formatting for, for the, these cells such that I have the label month included. So what I'll do is I'll just hit Control-1. It's going to open up my Format Cells box. I'm going to come to Custom. And then under Type, I'm going to do Month 0. All right, And all that does now is if I put a 1 in here, that's going to put Month right before it. And if I copy this with Formatting included to the right, and I just do plus one, all right, now a month two. What that gives me is this is still a value and, it, and Excel understands it as a value, but it, at the same time, it's a label and it helps me just visualize that's month one, that's month two. And so I'm gonna go all the way out to a 90 month analysis period, which is basically what this exercise called for. There's out the 70. Where am I at? 90. Okay. Now that I'm out to 90, I've got all of this real estate off to the right here that I don't want. And my, uh, you know, my cursor can get lost out in that. So what I like to do is I like to hide all of this unnecessary uh, real estate. So I just select all of the columns to the right of the area that I need to work with. I come here, I right click and I hit hide. And now I can jump back and forth without worrying about disappearing out into the right, okay? With my month header in place, let's do the year now. And the year's pretty simple. Again, I'm going to set this to be year. And then it's a round up month divided by 12 
no decimal points. And that will give me the year for each period. See that? Okay. And then finally, the date. And this particular date, I'm going to have the last day of each month. Well, in order to know what the first date is, uh, or the last day of the first period, I need an analysis start date. So down here, I'm just gonna write, type in analysis start. I'm going to change that to date, set those fonts blue, and I'll just do January 1st, 2018. And then up here, I'm just gonna type EO month, okay? My, fir my analysis start, the month, minus one, enter. And then I just copy this formula off to the right. And then I just do a confirmation, look at it. Yep, everything looks fine, okay? Which would make my last date June of 2025. And I've got my date header in place. Next. Uh, let's see, I want a break-even date. I'm going to need that. Uh, let's have net rentable area. Uh, let's put here development header. Uh, let's see, we're gonna want um, our budget items. We've got land, we've got financing costs, we've got hard costs, soft costs. And then we have TIs and LCs. Now. There's a more sophisticated way to do this, but because uh, the particular assumptions we're working with only have two tenants with no future generation tenants, we're assuming these tenants occupy and they run through to the end of the analysis period. I'm gonna make this simple. I'm gonna have TI1, TI2, leasing commissions one, leasing commissions two. And then I can just set the date or string of dates when I want those items to go out. Okay, and then let's see, I've got total before interest, and I've got construction interest, and then I have total project costs. And then I'm thinking about this, I've got amounts. And again, these are just my assumptions, right? So I've got an amount, I've got start. Now, the uh, assumptions call for straight line distribution of these expenses. So I don't have to do anything beyond just having a start and an end month. And then I'm going to do an air check here. And I do this throughout, you'll notice, uh, just to confirm that my modeling is correct. And I drop in the amounts. And we come over here and we see, let's see, 200,000 square foot building. Uh, break-even month, I'm not sure about that yet, so I'm gonna leave that blank. Uh, land is 20 million. Uh, let's see, financing cost 1% of value of the land, so 200,000. Uh, hard costs are 300 bucks a foot, okay. Oh, and by the way, I named this cell NRA. It just makes it, that's, whether you like to use name cells or not, there are a few there are a few values that I almost always create name cells for, and one of those is net rentable area because you use it so often. So 300 bucks a foot, soft costs, excluding LCs and debt, 15% of hard costs basically. So I believe that's what it says, right? Uh, yeah, 15% of hard costs. It doesn't say land, so I'm going to assume, assume that my soft costs are not a percentage of land. Um, then TIs. Now, TIs are 60 bucks a foot. They're paid at tenant occupancy. We have two tenants. You can see that here. Two tenants of equal size. So each tenant's 100,000 feet. So we've got this divided by two times 60 bucks. That's TI1 and TI2. LCs are 18 bucks a foot. Uh, paid six months before tenant occupies. So we're gonna do 18 bucks a foot times NRA divided by, oops, divided by two. All right. All right, so a million eight. So then we just sum it. I just hit Alt equals. It's gonna sum everything above there. And I'm gonna hit Alt, uh, Control, underline, Control U to underline that. So now we have our total before interest Construction interest, I'm going to highlight this to remind myself to come back to it at a future point. And then my 
total project costs are total before interest cost plus interest or 104.8 so far. The next thing I'm going to do is I want to determine when these items happen in my construction draw schedule. So first I'm going to take all these cells and I'm going to label them as month, month something, right? So land, for instance, will start month one and end month one, meaning the the first month that that land, uh, the land will, um, will purchase that in period one and it will end in period one. Whereas financing costs, the same, right? Happens at land closing. Hard costs though, go throughout the entire construction period, which I believe was 24 months, beginning at land close date. So I put the end 24. Soft costs, I'll do the same, one to 24. Then the TIs, so let's see, uh, this says here, TIs paid at tenant occupancy. And what we know about this is the two tenant a lease up of equal size, one tenant at construction completion. All right, so if construction completion is 24, that tenant would occupy in month 25. The second tenant, uh, one, six months after, so 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Actually, let's put that at 30. I'd assume it's six months following construction completion rather than six months following uh, this first occupancy, okay? And then LCs come paid six months before tenant occupancy. Uh, oh, and by the way, so this happens in one period, so I just put 25 and 30 there. And then if this happens six months before, I'll put this at 19, this one at 24, okay? So that's when these cash flows are going out. Now, just to clean this up, just so I can visualize what the beginning and end of that total amount is, I'm gonna drop it there. Also based on that, that first tenant, which occupies 50% of the space, uh, goes in month 25. That tells me, and we'll have to confirm this, that break even is going to be in month 25. And why is this break even value important? Well, that's when uh, there's gonna be sufficient operating cash flow to cover our interest uh, reserve or our interest expense. And since here it says use available cash flow to offset debt costs, I'm just going to assume, uh, even though construction ends month 24, well, I guess in this case, because we occupy the next, the next month, uh, it's, this isn't net, well, what it really means is we're gonna be using operating cash flow from uh, operation begin to cover interest. And with our, assum our development assumptions in place, let's just go ahead and model these out. Now we only need to do one formula. And what we're doing here is we're going to ask, does this month, is that month greater than or equal to this month? Okay, and notice I'm locking in either uh, my column or row uh, such that I can just copy this over to the right and down. But it's also, so I'm asking first, is, is that date greater than or equal to the start? And is this date less than or equal to the end, okay? And if so, it's gonna, it's, it will uh, return a one. And if it returns a one, I can multiply that one by the total amount. And one times the total amount is the value that will appear in that cell. Now the, the challenge or the problem with that is in the case where we have more than one period, uh, we would, we would, return an amount far greater than the to than this total amount here. And so what we need to do is we need to break this down such that we're gonna divide this by, let's see, we'll divide it by the difference between end and start, but then we need to add one, okay? And I believe it's going to work, let's find out. So I just copy these all to the right and I copy these down. Let's sum this here to have a sum row. And so I think it's right, but let's do an air check. So I'm just going to take the sum of these and see if it's equal to that. And if it is, in all cases, which it is, 
then our error check came back right. Now, what I want to do is I, rather than just returning true, which uh, another user who uses this may not understand this, I'm going to use an if statement. I'm going to say if that ends up, if that's true, let's return OK. Otherwise, let's return error. Okay. And all of that checked out. So what that tells us is that all these cash flows off to the right equal these amounts here. Okay. And if you want to see it just visually, I can do that one and notice that equals that. Okay. Now all that's left in our development cash flows, well at this point, is to handle the interest, which I'm going to hold off just for a minute. Uh, let's underline those. Let's copy that over. Okay, but I highlight it yellow to remind myself I need to come back and do that. So next, what we're going to do is sources and uses. Here's where we're breaking down equity and debt. And how the exercise calls for this to happen is that equity will be drawn first, then debt. So think about this. You got the LP and the GP. They have equity in this deal. Uh, in this particular case, 60% of the total cost will be covered by the debt, meaning 40% is going to be covered by the equity. That's 95% uh, of which is the LP's responsibility, 5% is the GP's. And we need to understand when is, the, when is that equity capital going out to cover our project costs versus when is the loan, draw, the, the loan amounts going out to cover our project costs. So I'm going to come to sources and uses, and we have really two sources, okay? Uh, we've got loan and we've got equity and then we've got total sources. I'm also going to track the loan balance. Now I'm going to track the loan balance because I need that in order to calculate construction interest. The other thing I need to do, and because this is a simple model, now I don't typically recommend turning on iterative calculation because the more complex the model gets, uh, the more troublesome Excel's iterative calculation feature is. Uh, and what you'll find is it doesn't alert you in cases where it iterates to its max, but those number of iterations haven't arrived at a, pr a probable value. And you don't know that. And there's no way to know that. Uh, so that's one issue. Another issue is if, if you err at a certain point, uh, with an iterative calculation, but it's iterated and then errors, it, it will permanently break that model and you'll have to close and come back. And, and the remedy for that, there's a circuit breaker concept, which I've actually blogged about in the past, but it just creates a lot of headaches. And, and, and so if you look at my all-in-one, for instance, I don't use iterative calculation. I use a, a, just a simple macro and a button uh, that you push and it does the iterations for you. But in this case, this is a simple thing. We're just iterating some construction interest. Uh, we only have one tab. I think it makes sense. So you're going to need to come to your Excel options, formulas, just make sure this ena enable iterative calculation is checked. And with that, I've got my uh, headings here. Uh, so I'm going to think about this. Okay, I'm going to have loan to cost. I'll have some annual interest rate. I'm assuming that this loan is interest only through to the end of the analysis period. There was no mention of amortization, so I'm just gonna leave that or assume that's the case. What it also means is I'm assuming this is a construction perm loan. Uh, so the loan draws up to its maximum loan amount and that loan amount is the loan amount through to the end of the analysis period at which point it's paid off with, uh, with the terminal value, the, the sale. Uh, a 5% interest rate, I believe, is what we had assumed here. 60% loan to cost. These are both inputs. And then we have an output. So we have loan to cost times our total cost here. Uh, equity then is going to be the difference. And so we take our total project cost minus our loan. That's our equity. Total sources, the sum of that. Uh, and then same with loan to cost, it's a sum, and then it's just this is just a one minus that, okay? So now it's time to model the cash flows themselves. So I'm gonna start with the equity because it's the first going out and it's easier to think this way. So what does the equity look like? Well, uh, we start out with 41,920,000 of equity that's available for us to draw on. And so this is a pretty simple 
uh, formula. In each period, really what we're looking at is the minimum of the, re the amount required to spend in that period or the amount of equity available to us in that period to draw. Okay, so this is a min that versus this. However, the, the problem is, how, how do we know how much equity is available in this period? Well, here's the total minus the sum of any equity used in the past. And I'm going to use this cell, even though this cell isn't actually part of any of the periods. I just need to make sure to leave that blank at all times. Or at least not put any values in it. And I'm going to do a sum where I lock in the first cell and I leave the second cell open such that as I copy to the right, this cell will change, that cell will stay uh, absolute. Okay? So I do, I have my equity. My total sources is the sum of equity and debt. And then debt is what? Well, it's the total amount required in that period minus any equity used. Okay? With that, I can copy those to the right. And now we see equity goes out up until we run out of equity. And we can see that's by highlighting all of these. In the lower right, it says the sum of these cells, 41.92 million, 41.92 million. We can also do an air check. So we just take the sum of this equals this. That's true. Let's do our if. If that's true, then OK. Otherwise, error. OK, those. All right, cool. So let's do our loan balance now. So what is the loan balance? Well, the loan balance is the sum of this cell through to any cell in the future. So that's a similar thing. We're going to lock in this first cell, leave that second cell open, copy to the right. And now you see the loan balance scale up as we draw down the loan up until we hit 56,880. And that is our loan. Oh, oops, I guess 62,880. That's right, we had a TI here a little late, later. Okay, so 62,880. If we come back, 62,880. Now, uh, now we can come back and do our construction interest. Okay, so what is the construction interest? Well, it is the loan balance in that period multiplied by the interest rate. Lock that in, divided by 12, right? That's an annual rate. These are monthly periods. Copy this off to the right. And then this, we're just gonna take the sum of all of our... Now here's, the, here's one problem, right? 16 million in construction interest. Well, that's not true. So what, what did I do wrong? Well, the formula's right. It's just we're including construction in interest after we've hit, hit break even. And break even is when it, we're going to switch from construction interest to call it stabilized interest or operating interest, or whatever you want to call the type of debt service that happens on that we're going to be putting to, to operation versus capitalizing in our, in our um, development costs. And so that's where I'm going to use this break even concept. So essentially what I'm going to say is I'm going to use a just a logic is this less than and do that again let's see yeah this less than that if so we're going to multiply it by these that uh, interest formula we've done Okay, now, now we're at 1723. If I come out here to the right, you'll see that that ends month 24, right? Because in month 25 is when that first tenant occupies and begins paying rent. Now, in a minute, you'll actually see uh, that break even goes up a little bit because of uh, free rent assumptions. But for now, I'm just going to leave it there. We'll come back and, and update that assumption. So we can turn. We can remove the format or the uh, highlighting there. So let's move to the operations section. So I'm just going to title this operations. And there's 
a couple things I want in the header. Well, actually, the first thing I'm going to do here is now I'm going to lock in. Uh, let's see, view. I'm going to freeze my pane. So I'm just going to come right below my uh, date header, right to the right of my assumptions. I'm going to freeze the panes, okay? And what that'll freeze all my assumptions to the left and my header to the top, and now I can move left and right and retain that information that I need. So I move down, but there are some items that I want in a special operation header. And the first is I want an operation month, operation year, all right? And that's so I understand where I'm at in, in my operation period. I also want to understand when my tenant leases are, okay? And I'll use that for my tenant bumps. Again, there's more sophisticated ways to do this, but I'm looking to do this quick, right? Uh, we only have two tenants, no future tenant, no future generation tenants. This is, in my view, or at least in my mind, the, the, the simplest way to do it. I wanna track occupancy, I'm gonna need that. And then I'm just gonna get started here. So I've got rental, Income with tenant number one, tenant number two. I've got an adjustment to my rental income via free rent for the first tenant and free rent for the second tenant. And then I've got total rental income, right? Now one other thing I want to include here uh, in terms of inputs, I'm gonna do an operation begin date. It's also one that we're going to need. Zero is going to be a 25. Turn that blue as an input. OK. So our break even will differ from our operation begin date. So now that we have kind of our labels, uh, we are going to have a start month. We'll have annual starting rent. Uh, there'll be some annual increase in that rent. And then there's a square footage. Each one of these are 100,000 a piece. We're gonna increase the each 3% a year. Uh, tenant one starts in month 25, tenant two in month 30. And then in terms of the rent, so this says 425 triple net. Now, that has to be per month. Uh, so maybe this exercise is a California exercise where they do quote rents on a monthly basis. Generally, you'd see this on an annual. So I assumed initially that this is 425. That sounds like an industrial rent. But then when I started looking into things like operating expenses are 16 bucks a foot a year, um, it's gotta be 425 times 12, which that's a $51 um, a year rents. It seems pretty high, but anyway. Um, that's what the exercise calls for. So 5.1 million for each of the tenants. That's the rent that uh, we have. And then in terms of free rent, uh, there's a start and then there's an end. Okay, and so what I did is I went in here and I just changed the label such that it says start month zero. So I put start month 25. And then I did a similar thing here, end month 27. And what is, what is that doing? Well, if you notice here, it has three months free rent. And so what I'm assuming is month 25, 26 through 27 is free. They, they still pay reimbursements, but they don't pay uh, actual rent. Now it doesn't detail that or not. And so that's the assumption I'm making. Uh, and we'd have to dig into this and get better answers to it. And then for uh, the second tenant, it's a similar thing. First three months are free. So month 30, 31, 32, uh, free rent. And then in terms of uh, total income, I'm just going to take the minimum of that, or total rental income, they'll uh, starts in month 25, and the sum of that's these two, okay? So now let's model this out. So operation month, when does operation begin? Well, it begins in month 25. So I'm just gonna use an if statement. Oops. So if this, my analysis month, is less than my operation begin month, then I'm just gonna return a zero here. Otherwise, I wanna return, let's see, uh, G7 minus my operation begin month 
So for instance, when this is when the analysis month is 25 and the operate that would be the first month of operation. So it's 25 minus 25 plus one. And then I copy this out to the right just so we can look at it and make sure that in month 25, okay, there's a one, two, and up and so forth. And then operation year is that roundup concept. Round up our month divided by 12. No digits beyond that. And that tells us the operation year. So our first year starts in month 25. Our second year begins in month 37 and so forth. Now here's the question. When does tenant number one, when does its first uh, lease, when does its first lease year begin? And, and when is its second year and third year and so forth? Well. That's a that's a roundup is a roundup function as well, but I'm going to use a max first, right? Because if not, I'm going to get a negative value in some case. So I'm going to use a max, and what I'll do is I'm going to take that. I'm going to lock in the row minus my start month. I'm going to lock in the column, and I'm going to plus one just like we did before. All right. Oops. I'm going to that's a roundup that value, right? And uh, we need to put these inside of parentheses. Divide that by 12, zero. And it's a max of that or zero. Such that if otherwise, and it doesn't really matter, we would have gotten a negative value here and this is more just for looks than anything. But so now we understand that the first, this tenant's first lease year begins month 25. The second tenant should begin in month 30. So let's come out here to the right and look. It starts month 30, right? And then there should be 12 periods, which there are, and then month 42, it's second year lease start, uh, second year starts, okay? And then in terms of occupancy, we'll do that here in a second. So now that we understand when these tenants begin, this is a pretty simple formula. First, we're going to ask, has the lease begun? And we do that by looking at this, locking in the row. Is that greater than or equal to my start month? If so, we're gonna times that by the rent in that month, which is the annual rent divided by 12 to make it monthly. And then we're gonna multiply it by our growth rate, one plus that, Lock in the row, raised to this tenant's lease year, minus one, right? Minus one because in year one, we don't want to actually grow it. We want to leave it uh, flat. And so year one becomes zero, year two becomes one, etc. Okay. And doing that, we're going to copy this one down, copy both tenants over. And then let's go out and look and see what happens. So sure enough, month 25. And that first, those first 12 months, we should see 5.1 million. Sure enough, 5.1 million. Second tenant begins month 30. We should see 5.1 million in that first 12 periods, which we do. And then we should, should see bumps thereafter, which we do. Okay. So we've modeled the tenant's rent. Now let's model the free rent. So how is this free rent working? Well, really all we're saying is if this period is equal to some period between 25 and 27. We want a negative value equal to the rent that that tenant was meant to pay in that period, All right? So this is an and. So and it, so what we're really saying is and that is greater than or equal to that value and that value is less than or equal to that value. So when that logic occurs, we're gonna multiply that one by this, whatever that was in tenant one. And I made it negative because we're gonna be adding these together. And I can copy that down. And I'm gonna sum the total, underline, copy off to the right. And then we should see three negative, well, one, two, three. And notice how these offset this, 
and makes for free rent, right? These are called adjustments. And then out here, one, two, three, with no more to the end, which is exactly what we wanted to see. So we've now modeled total rental income. Now let's see, well, we're not quite ready for break even. So we modeled uh, total rental income. Now we have other income. And the only other income item we have, uh, let's see, is expense recovery. Now this is triple net and uh, triple net in where the tenant is reimbursing 100% of operating expenses. However, in the exercise, it mentions operating expenses during lease up. And, and how I read that was uh, we need to account for uh, the operating expenses in those months where uh, the full amount of operating expenses are not being recovered because we're not 100% occupied. In order, in order to do that, we now need to model both, both of our both our expenses as well as our expense recovery. So we have this expense recovery. I'm going to leave this for now because we need our operating expenses in order to model uh, the recovery. But the total then becomes potential gross income PGI, uh, and PGI then okay. So. After PGI, we're going to have general vacancy, which we'll do in a second. From there, it's effective gross income or effective gross revenue, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And then we move down here. We've got, uh, let's do operating expenses here because I have some, let's see, we're going to have a start month. Uh, we're going to have an annual uh, start amount some annual increase and those are some assumptions for our operating expenses and then after operating expenses we have net operating income right so operating expenses when do they begin well they begin operation begin date okay and i'm just going to black that one out and assume that's not an input our annual operating expenses though are 16 bucks a foot times nra Whoops. Let me just multiply it by here. Okay. And then the model or the assumptions don't tell us anything about rent or expense growth. So I'm going to leave that zero. But just to demonstrate to the powers that be, so I'm, just, I'm putting myself in, in your shoes, you're interviewing. Uh, this is a situation where you're going to demonstrate that, yeah, you're typically going to have some growth in your operating expenses. So you want to demonstrate that you can model that. So we're going to model out our operating expenses. And to do that, first, I'm going to ask, is this date, lock in the row, greater than or equal to my start? Okay. And if it is multiplied by uh, the amount of expenses divided by 12, recall, right? Because uh, that's an annual number and these are monthly periods. And then we wanna grow it. What are we growing it by? One plus that amount, lock in the column, raised to our operation month, right? Oops, I'm sorry, operation year. Right, not our month, uh, that would be a very large number. Minus one, okay, now we can copy this out to the right. And we should see, let's take a look here. Month 25, 2667, that totals 3.2 million, 3.2 million, yeah, okay. So now we have operating expenses. With operating expenses done, what we can do now is we can do expense recovery. Well, how, how are we gonna do expense recovery? Well, we know it's 100% of, of operating expenses. So I'm just gonna drop in a 100% here. And all I'm saying is these tenants will recover 100% of their pro rata share of recoverable operating expenses. And what is that amount? Well, you know, that 3.2 million when they're fully occupied, okay? And so what's the formula for this? I would think of the formula as occupancy in that period 
multiplied by whatever recovery percentage uh, these tenants are going to recover times operating expense, total operating expenses. Well, in order to do that, we need an occupancy value here. Now, there is a more sophisticated way to model occupancy than this, but since this is the exercise, this is a, it's actually pretty simple, right? We have two tenants. Each tenant uh, makes up 50% of the building. So all we have to do is we have to say, if this is greater than zero, multiply it by 0.5, plus if this one is greater than zero, multiply that by 0.5, all right? Such that when both of those are greater than zero, we get 100%. When only one of them is greater than zero, we get 50%. And uh, it's really that simple. So with that occupancy, then now we can come down and we can do our expense recovery, which becomes, again, occupancy times that times operating expenses off to the right. And then let's just confirm. So we're going to come out here. And so during that period, we're 50 percent. Look at that. Half of the operating expenses are being recovered. And then beyond that, 100 percent through to the end. And their ex uh, expense recovery is done. And so now we can do uh, potential gross income, which is our total rental income plus expense recovery. All right. And then we have general vacancy. Let's do this one. So general vacancy, what, is, what do they say here? He says lease up to 95%. Now what I hear from that is if it's 50% leased, we're not going to be hitting that 50% with a general vacancy because we're less than 95. So it's the greater of, or I'm sorry, it's the lesser of, of actual vacancy or 95%. In order to do that, again, uh, in a simple situation like that, all we're really going to say is if this is less than or equal to... Um, Well, we need assumption. So uh, we have a 5% general vacancy. And I'm going to make this even simpler. Uh, because there's just the two tenants, I guess what I could really say is if that, oops, so my formula is if occupancy is 100%, then I'm going to hit it with vacancy. And I'm going to make this a negative value. Hit it with vacancy, and it's the potential gross income. So I'll be hitting both my expense recovery and total rental income. Oops, with the five percent. Close that. That one too. Okay, so now we can look and see. I hope I'm, you're not getting dizzy watching that. We go back and forth. Okay, once we go to. Um, yeah, here we go. Once it goes to 100% occupancy, we start hitting it with the vacancy. And now effective gross is potential gross plus our vacancy number. Copy that to the right. Net, inc uh, net operating income then becomes effective gross income minus operating expenses. And we're to NOI. So now that we're at NOI, uh, the exercise doesn't discuss capital reserves. And I think uh, any good pro forma is going to have it. Um, it's probably an oversight by who the, the company that created this. And so it would be a, just good to show that you understand there is going to be a capital reserve here. Uh, and it'll just be some number. I'm going to make this super simple. Uh, I'm going to just treat this like operating from a modeling standpoint like the operating expenses model with the same and then i'm just going to use i don't know let's use a 50 cent 50 cents a square foot reserve that's probably that's probably high um, let's use 30 cents for the gp we're going to use something probably more conservative like that okay so that's sixty thousand a year And so then I can actually just copy the uh, 
if I built this formula correctly. Let's see if I did. Yeah, I did. Cool. So I can just copy that down. Now I am going to zero this out, but I'm going to include the line so that the employer knows that that's going to be needed. And then that gets me to cash flow from operations, CFO. All right, or some might call this net income, some might call it a cash flow before financing, um, cash flow before debt service, a lot of different, uh, you know, nomenclature for all of these differ from region and company and uh, uh, where, where you go to school, et cetera, but I'm using cash flow from operation. And cash flow from operation is net operating income minus capital reserve. Copy that out, and I'm done with my operation. Oh, and uh, you know how could I forget debt service? So we need a layer in debt. I'm assuming this is interest only, so I'm going to label it as such just to remind uh, myself. Um, then I have cash flow after financing, and then my debt service. If you recall, uh, I'm capitalizing interest through to break even. Oh, and by the way, let's look at when break even is. So what I'm going to do, now that I am to NOI, let's see at what point, okay. We hit break even in month 20, all right, 27 is our last month, so month 28. So let, we're, I'm just gonna come up here and change break even to 28. All of this is dynamic. So now I'm capitalizing interest through to break even, but I'd need debt service then to begin. If this ends in 27, I need it to begin in month 28. So how I do that is I'm going to ask if that break even, if this is, uh, let's see, less than or equal to, Actually, that's just if it's less than break even. If it's less than break even, I'm going to do zero. Otherwise, this is a pretty simple calculation. I'm going to take the loan amount in that period. So let's just use the loan amount in that period. Let's see, where's our loan balance? Right there. Okay, I'll take the loan balance. I'm going to multiply that by. The interest rate, I'm going to divide it by 12. That should get us debt service. And then cash flow after financing is that. Let's copy these over. Let's see what we get just to make sure. And I need to format those cells. And that did not work right. What did I do wrong? Oh, I forgot to lock in that cell. All right, so it looks like D9 for that. All right, so now month 28, we should see our first, yep, month 28, our first debt service payment coming out of operation. Before that notice, there's these three months of operating shortfall. The, the exercise didn't ask us to account for operating shortfall in our, to, to capitalize it in our development budget, so I haven't. That's an extra step um, that I'm not going to get into in this video. It's more complex. To, it's another iterative calculation concept similar to uh, the interest reserve. So now I am done with the operation period. So let's move over. So what happens next? So we finish, we get our development cash flows out. We begin to get inflows from our operation period. And then at the end of some analysis, uh, which in this case, they said 60 or no, five years after stabilization, we're going to sell. Okay. So we're going to call this terminal value. And in that we've got a terminal month that we need to track. We've got a terminal cap rate. We've got some terminal NOI. Uh, let's see, that will get us to a gross terminal value. There'll be some selling costs and then there'll be a net terminal value after selling costs, but before paying off our loan. And the terminal month is, well, you know, to make this simple, I'm just going to say it's the max of our all of that row, but really it's just month 90. The reason I do max of that row is if for some reason I were to delete rows or add rows, that will keep that'll keep this terminal value dynamic. Okay, 
Uh, then there's a terminal cap rate. I believe it said five and a half percent. Yeah, five and a half percent. Terminal NOI, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find month 90. So I'm going to use an index. I'm going to come to NOI. Index that, row one, column 90. Okay. That's my NOI in my very last month. Now, this is super simplistic, but I'm just going to annualize that or take that number and multiply it by 12. And that's my terminal NOI. Um, most cases, that would be some forecast of the next 12 months. Um, but for this, these purposes, I'm going to, oops, what did I do wrong? There we go. So I come up with a gross terminal value or NOI divided by our cap rate. That gets us to our gross this 201, 201 million. We have some selling costs, one and a half percent. So I'm gonna take one and a half times by our gross terminal value and then our net will be the balance after subtracting the selling cost. So 198 million is what we're expecting to net from this before paying off the loan. Then over here, what we're gonna track is we're going to track the net terminal value cash flow. We're gonna track the loan payoff and we're gonna track net proceeds. Uh, from sale, right? So the net terminal value will be this amount. The loan payoff will be whatever the loan balance is in that period. Net proceeds will be uh, net terminal value minus loan payoff. So what we're going to ask is, uh, is that month equal to that? If so, the net terminal value we're going to do. Otherwise, it'll be zero. Okay, and you see that happen. Loan payoff, uh, we're gonna use the same formula. I'm just gonna copy this formula. The difference is we're gonna multiply that true statement by the loan balance in the period. Okay, and then net proceeds from sale becomes, there we go, the difference. And with our terminal value in place, we can now go to our property level cash flows. Right? These are our this is our now our return calculation. And we have an unlevered or some unlevered cash flow line. All right, that's gonna be the sum of all of these outflows and in inflows. Uh, we've got an unlevered IRR, unlevered equity multiple. Uh, and then there's going to be some contributions and distributions to the partnership before the split between the partners. And the difference then becomes the net profit. So what is our unlevered cash flow line look like? Well, it's going to be, right? So think about it. This is before debt. First, we have all of our outflows. Well, what are our outflows? Uh, well, that's those development costs before interest. So our total before interest, that line, okay? So in period one, we have that go out. What do we have come in? Well, let's see, we've got, uh, so we immediately go now to, the, so what's coming in is our cash flow from operations, right? So our that last cash flow line before uh, we start paying debt. And then we also have coming in our net terminal value. If you recall, net terminal value is our gross minus our selling cost, but before paying off the loan. Since this is unlevered, that's the cash flow line. We can copy this over to the right and it becomes our total unlevered cash flow. And then we can just run an IRR. Now I'm going to use an X IRR, find these values, uh, use our analysis date. And this is really the only time, the only place we use the analysis date and it gets us an IRR. Now, we before we do the multiple, what we want to do is we want to calculate what's our contributions versus distributions. Contributions are uh, equity in, distributions equity or dollars out. Now, this is before debt, so um, equity in is essentially any dollar that we invest into this or any negative cash flow in a period would be considered a contribution. So I'm just going to use a sum if. And I'm going to sum if everything from that row, lock that in. And the criteria is any cash flow that's less than zero, I'm going to sum. Okay. 
and it gets me this negative 104. Now you have a couple options. You can leave it negative, which I'm going to do, um, or you can set it positive if you know that makes you feel better just visually. But we've got 104 million going out, 249 million coming in. The net profit profit is uh, the sum of those two, or 144 million. And then our equity multiple is simply our total distributions divided by our total contributions. Now notice I set contributions positive to give us a positive value there. And 2.38 times. So in other words, uh, our equity investment grew by 2.38 times over the whole period. With our unlevered cash flow done, I'm just gonna copy this because a lot of this I'm going to use on my levered. So I'm gonna come down here, copy that, change this to levered, 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 or in other words, with debt. And I believe most of these formulas should almost, see I can, I'm just redoing these formulas to work with this new line. Okay, cool. Now all I need to do, I just need to update this line. Now this line obviously is going to include more cash flows because it includes debt. And what do those cash flows look like? Again, because we set this up right up top, this is fairly simple. All right, we've got a negative cash flow in total project costs, including interest. But then we have a positive cash flow with a loan coming in, right? So we're, what we're, this is an equity return. That's what a, a levered return is. And in fact, I think the assumptions call it that, an equity return. So we wanna understand the equity cash flows. Well, as, as a partnership, yeah, we're investing this 20, three million in period one, but then we're getting back in period one, some loan draw, well, zero in that case, but in a future period, we'll get some loan draws that will offset such that we'll only have equity out over the first eight months. Then we won't have any more equity out uh, with the uh, small exception of our um, operating deficit right there at the beginning of operation through to the end of the hold. Okay, so uh, I do a negative project cash flow plus loan draw and then I move into the operations and my cash flow after financing, right? I'm gonna plus that and I'm gonna plus net proceeds from sale. That's uh, that proceeds after paying off the loan. That is my formula that I can copy to the right for levered cash flow. And now we get a levered return, 22.58. Seems reasonable given our unlevered uh, IRR. Equity multiple juices quite a bit, again, because we're using leverage. Contributions, right? Uh, only 40% of the total, roughly, because we're using the loan. Uh, but then the distributions are less because we had to pay off the loan, plus pay construction interest. 57 minutes in, we're almost done. Uh, all we're moving to is the most exciting part, partnership level cash flows, uh, otherwise known as the waterfall. So what we have here, right, is we've done our property level uh, return uh, calculations. And so if, if, if our, us and our partners had the exact same split pro rata, every dollar that comes out, we split it pro rata based on the amount of dollars that we each contribute in, uh, proportionate to the, the number of the amount of dollars we, we each put, are putting in, then this partnership level cash flow would not be necessary. Um, but since there's a promote, Right, so there's some preferred return. I believe 12% is what we're using. And then above a 12, a disproportionate amount of the distributions go to the GP um, as a reward for outperforming. And if we come here and look, the joint venture structure is LP invests 95% of required equity, GP the balance 5%. GP receives then 20% promoted interest over a 12% IRR. Now what I'm assuming is up to a 12. Uh, the LP and the GP split the distributions pro rata, 95.5. Okay, and then above a 12, 20% to the GP, 80% to the LP. Incredibly simple waterfall to do, right? Because first, what do we have? Well, I first want to understand the equity split. So I have equity share, we've got LP contributions. We've got GP contributions, and then we've got total contributions. And up top, we already know on a levered basis 
what the total contributions are. So let's just break this down between LP contributions and GP contributions. So the percentage share for each is 95 to the LP, the difference to the GP, 5%. And the amount then becomes at 95 times your total contributions, right? And let's just make this positive. We can see that. And then the sum, oops. Okay. So we have there the breakdown. And that answers one of these questions. Uh, required project equity, well, that's this 43,308. Um, required LP equity, 41,143. But what I also want to do here is I want to watch or see how this goes out. So I'm just going to take, <clears throat> I'm going to take the minimum of that line or zero. I'm going to multiply it by the partner's equity share. Oops. Got to lock that cell in place here. Okay. Now we're seeing each partner's contribution in each period, right? I can also do an air check. Let's just make sure our cash flows are lining up. Now I'm going to use a round. All right, so I'm going to round the sum of these because there there may be some rounding, uh, there may be a rounding difference that could throw this calculation off. So if I just round it, and I also have to set the sum of those cash flows positive. Okay, that's true. And if it's true, I'm going to make that okay. Otherwise, I'm going to make it an error. Okay, all right, so all those are good. So I've got the contributions. Now let's calculate the preferred return plus return of capital. To do that, there's a few headings I'm going, a few items I'm going to be tracking. I'll be tracking LP's capital account, beginning balance, some other items. Let me pause it all this dude. Okay, so we're going to be tracking the LP's capital account. There'll be some required return in each period based on the, uh, the beginning balance of that capital account. Uh, there'll be the contributions from the period that we already discussed, and then there'll be some distribution depending on the amount of cash flow distribu distributable in that period. And then we'll have an ending balance uh, together with a total cash flow uh, sum of contributions and distributions. So the beginning balance is simple, right? It is the balance at the end of the last period, okay? And that is done. The required return is essentially the hurdle, which in this case is a 12% preferred return. It's uh, that period's proportion of that 12% on the beginning balance. And so the formula is going to look something like this. We're going to we're going to take the beginning balance. We're going to multiply it by one plus our re required return raised to the one divided by twelve minus one. And and you might ask why did I raise it to the one divided by 12 minus one. That has to do with the, we need to track this on, in a similar fashion that the XIRR function does where it, it is um, compounding returns on a monthly basis. And so while it's a 12% 12, 12 annualized return, uh, we need to track it on a, on a monthly ba a monthly return such that the hurdle is the 12% IRR. And you'll see that in a second because I'll be using an XIRR to, to, to air check this and it requires this formula to get the required return right. So that's the required return. Contributions are, let's see here, just the, this is LP, so LP's contributions, I'm setting it positive. Distributions. 
Well, what do we know? We know that the LP is getting 95% of distributable cash flow up to a 12. And so what, what does that mean? Well, it's gonna look something like this. We're gonna, going to take the minimum of, and I say minimum because once we hit 12, it's gonna to flow to the promote. And so it's gonna be the minimum of whatever's in the capital account, so return of capital, plus the, re the required return in that period, or basically w whatever the amount of cash flow uh, is um, in, let's see, our levered cash flow line, right? However, we don't want to distribute negative cash flow. So we're gonna use a max, that, or zero. But they're only, they only have rights to 95% of that. So we're gonna multiply that by 95% or cell C90, okay? And finally, what's the ending balance? Well, it's pretty simple. It's the beginning balance capital account plus, oops, beginning balance capital account plus any required return, right? Uh, plus any additional contributions made in that period, minus any distributions made to the partner. And that gets us to our ending balance for the capital account. And then the cash, the, the net cash flow is just negative contributions plus distributions. We can copy all of this to the right. And let's see if we're correct. Now, how do we see if we're correct? Well, we're gonna do an XIRR. We're gonna use that line. We're going to take the dates, 12. And so we're correct. And that's pretty good that we got it in one shot. <laughs> so what does the GP's uh, cash flows look like in this first tier? Well, the contributions we know, they're there, I'm just turning them positive. Oops, wrong. Contributions. Distributions then become, we know that they have what? The right to one minus 95%, so 5% in this case. So, well, what is distributable? Well, we already calculated that here with the LP, but then we hit it with the 95%. So what we wanna first understand, we wanna gross that back up to 100%. We just do that by taking this and we divide it by that, okay? And then we hit that with the 5%. Get GP's total cash flow, copy it out to the right. Doesn't look like I did it right, so I missed something here. Oh, I uh, forgot to lock that in. There we go. Looks correct, but let's see. Let's do the XIRR for the GP. Yep, 12%. And then we finish with the promoted interest. Now, uh, since there's only one tier above our preferred return, this is incredibly simple. We've got remaining distributable cash flow. We've got an LP distribution in this tier. We've got a GP distribution. Uh, let's see, the LP is getting what, 80%, GP is getting one minus that, 20%. So what is left to distribute? Well, it would be, all right, so we've got this levered cash flow line. This is the total cash flow to at, at the property level that flows to the partnership. Basically, anything that is positive is distributable cash. So I'm just gonna take the max of this and zero and call that uh, distributable. But then what has been distributed? Well, that amount to the LP and that amount to the GP. So whatever's left over is remaining. 
and it should only be at the very last period, right? That 80 million 829 that's left. So that's what's remaining, and then it's just a matter of splitting that up 80 20. Take that, multiply it by that. Oops, I didn't, I didn't equal. Multiply. Same here. Put that over. Oops. Yeah, so let's see. Those two together, 88, 29, 194. Okay, cool. So we finished our waterfall. We see the distribu contributions and distributions uh, at those different levels. Now it's just a matter of doing LP and GP cash flows. Let me drop in these labels. LP first. Let's also do the labels for the GP. And replace LP with GP. Okay. And then, so what are our contributions? Well, contributions, actually, I already have this line right there. Okay. The distributions are one plus two. Some of that is the total. And then for the GP contributions, we already have there. Distributions in tier one, tier two. Some of that. Let's copy all these over. And let's do an XIRR for that line. Dates 21.4 to the LP, 38.4 to the GP. And then we'll just do a sum of these. That's the LP, that's the GP. Oops. What did I do wrong? Oh, there we go. Uh, 2165, 2165, 41, 143, 41, 143. It's checking out so far. And then let's just do our equity multiple distribution. Divided by negative contributions, 3.59, 9.49 to the GP. So let's do now a master air check. And then we'll be done. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just grab the levered cash flow line from our property level returns. And then I'm going to just grab the sum of LP's net cash flow and GP's net cash flow, and those two should equal one another. Okay. And assuming they do, which they do, I'm just going to do if uh, and okay. Okay, an hour and 15 in and we're pretty much done. Now, I think I might have an error in here somewhere. Um, I went through very fast. I, typically, as I'm going through, I'm, I'm checking myself a little bit better than I, I uh, do. I, in fact, I noticed an error and I paused it where I had not, you may have seen it, I hadn't summed this line to get our total project cost, so that wasn't... Um, balancing out my interest correctly. Uh, otherwise, I think I'm pretty dang close. Um, I'm just looking at, I'm comparing uh, when I did it initially and when I'm doing it again, it's pretty close. So there you have it. Uh, over here, you got required output, like, so you got required project equity, right? Well, that's this total equity required here. So let's go to property level cash flows, 43,308, okay? Net profit. So that 125 million. It asks for an IRR. Uh, well, we've got a project level, level IRR here, and then we've got an LP level IRR here. Uh, asks for return on capital. 
I'm using an equity multiple as a proxy for that. Uh, every shop's a little different. I prefer that. Um, we could do a yield on cost calculation where we look at the NOI in year one divided by our, um, our total project cost and uh, compare that yield on cost to our market, our 5.5% cap rate and see what kind of a development spread uh, pop we have in, um, in this. Um, and then again, on the, from the LP standpoint, what's the LP's required uh, equity? 41 million, um, their net profit, their IRR, uh, their equity multiple. So in an hour and 15, uh, we got her done. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I apologize it took so long, but I think it's a valuable exercise. Uh, and it was a lot of fun to do on a, my Thanksgiving break. So thanks guys for watching.